Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> I was doing pretty good till the end. <laughs> and uh, I'm Christopher Buckley, and I'm honored uh, to be here with friends, colleagues, uh, celebrating and giving thanks uh, for Phil Levine. We are, of course, uh, preaching to the converted when it comes to the importance and accomplishment of Phil's poetry. For the last 40 years or more, he was our preeminent poet, our inspiration, no one like him ever. Phil's poetry of work emphasized in blazing detail the dignity of the worker, the individual, and was singular in American letters. But it was maybe half of his accomplishment. The media articles for his appointment as poet laureate, the obituaries pointed only to this. But it is important to remember the poems of the Spanish Civil War, the lyric narratives cherishing family, the translations from the Spanish, the incredible long poems throughout his career. No one, I mean absolutely no one, wrote as many inventive and brilliant long poems over 50 years. And finally, often overlooked are Phil's metaphysical poems. Those unique poems in which he forged a secular vision of hope for our spirits and our lives, which praised our collective being. But as grateful as we are for this singular body of work, we are even more grateful for the man. Our friend, comrade, father, husband, and mentor, there was no one more generous with his time, gifts, insight, experience, I was 28 when I came to teach at Fresno State. Friends had already won book awards, money prizes, and published in better journals. I was feeling a bit left behind in the dust with three early morning classes of composition. And then I received the most important poetry award of my life. I was assigned to share an office with Phil. For a couple years, I sat at my desk correcting piles of papers, waiting for Phil to come in in the afternoons, at which time I'd throw up a question about a current poem or a poet or a journal, and my tutorials in poetry and life began. Phil gave great advice, not just about poetry, but about how to keep my head on straight through all the vicissitudes. His advice and care were essential in getting me through those early years. He emphasized the value of work for its own worth, patience, fortitude, modesty, dedication, and honesty. Phil wrote hundreds of letters by hand to me and many others. He wrote letters for me to the Guggenheim for over 20 years. And when I finally received the fellowship, I called Phil immediately to say I had good news for us both. I would not be asking for more letters. <laughs> there are four anthology of Phil's students who went on to publish and have careers in poetry. If you look around, there's a wealth of talent in this room. So much so that perhaps some would have gone on to their accomplishments and careers without the inspiration and mentoring, the brilliant teaching and support of Phil. I certainly would not have. There has been no one over the last half century who has given more to students, to poets, and poetry than Phil, with scant exception. Every one of us has a life in poetry, and hence a life, because we knew or studied with Philip Levine. The most notable name on that list of students, of course, is Larry Levis, the genius of his generation. When I was editing the University of Michigan Press book on the poetry of Philip Levine, Stranger to Nothing, I asked Larry to write an original essay for the collection. The result was Philip Levine, an essay which is the hallmark of the book, a remembrance at once hilarious 
in recalling Phil in the classroom in the 60s and poignant in its tribute and testament to the value of great teachers. Speaking to Phil's generosity, how essential he was to all of our lives, Larry says it better than I ever can. To attempt to be at all objective about my friend and first teacher, Philip Levine, is impossible for me. For to have been a student in Levine's classes from the mid to late 1960s was to have a life, or what has turned out to be my life, given to me by another. It isn't enough to say that Levine was a brilliant young poet and teacher. Levine was amazing. His classes during those four years at Fresno State College were wonders and they still suggest how much good someone might do in the world. For in any of those 50-minute periods, there was more passion, sense, hilarity, and feeling filling that classroom than anyone could have found anywhere in 1964. Whenever I try to imagine the life I might have had had I not met Levine, if he had never been my teacher, if we had not become friends and exchanged poems and hundreds of letters over the past 25 years, I can't imagine it. I cannot see myself walking down one of those streets as a lawyer or the boss of a packing shed or even as the farmer my father wished I would become. And when I try to do this, no one's there. It seemed instead that I simply had never been at all. All there is on that street, the leaves on the shade trees that line it, curled and black and closeted against noon heat, is a space where I am not. I'm going to uh, conclude uh, reading Phil's poem, Ascension. Uh, this is uh, a broadside keepsake that will be passed out uh, after the event today to all of you. Um, we want to thank uh, Tim Geiger at the Oriole Press for producing this for this event. Ascension. Now I see the stars are ready for me. And the light falls upon my shoulders evenly. So little light that even the night birds can't see me robed in black flame. I am alone rising through clouds and the lights of distant cities until the earth turns its darker side away. And I am ready to meet my guardians or speak again the first words born in time. Instead, it is like that dream in which a friend leaves and you wait, parked by the side of the road that leads home until you can feel your skin wrinkling and your hair grown long and tangling in the winds, and still you wait, because you've waited so long. Below the earth has turned to light, but unlike the story good in paradise, I see no going and coming, none of the pain I would have suffered had I merely lived. At first, I can remember my wife, the immense depth of her eyes, and her smooth brow in morning light, the long life body moving about her garden day after day, at ease in the light of those brutal summers. I can see my youngest son again moving with the slight swagger of the carpenter hitching up his belt of tools. I can even remember the feel of certain old shirts against my back and shoulders and how my arms ached after a day of work. Then I forget exhaustion, I forget love, forget the need to be a man, the need to speak the truth, to close my eyes and talk to someone distant but surely listening. Then I forget my own trees at evening, moving in the day's last heat like the children of the wind. I forget the hunger for food, for belief, for love, I forget the fear of death, the fear of living forever. I forget my brother, my name, my own life. I have risen. Somewhere I am a god. Somewhere I am holy. I am a holy object. 
somewhere I am.